Welcome to Honest Conversations in Black and White. My name is Virgil Walker. I'm here with Scott Annual. Uh, we're excited to be joined by a special guest. Before I tee that up, I just want to tell you how uh, excited we are about the things we're going to be discussing. That We have an incredible show planned for you. Uh, I can't wait to particularly talk about the book. And I want to start out by, by explaining something. Because, Scott, I get asked all the time, okay, black and white, is this about race? Is yeah. this about, you know? Right. Cause, and I have to keep explaining that. Because you're black and I'm white. Just N- No. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but that's not what we mean, right? That is not what oh, we mean, okay. man. Yeah. Come on, dude. Well, it's a natural, you know. I get it. Yeah. I get But people have got to think more deeply. Yeah. People have got to think more deeply. They got to look behind us. They got to look behind us. There you go. If they look behind us, they see the black letters, white paper. Yeah. This is, all what we're doing, we're still introing this thing. It's, it's all, all that we're doing is we're talking about issues related to things that are written. Yeah. Books, articles. Articles, yeah. Really, this is more in, in, in your wheelhouse with, yeah. with all the G3 press stuff. Yep, yep, yeah, yeah. But you're doing writing too. I, I am. Yeah. I am getting Regular. better at it, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're uh, just talking about end dashes, the importance of end right, dashes. Right, right. I'm nerdy learning Nerdy stuff that. like that. Very nerdy stuff. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to get better at that. It's, yeah. Taking me some time to get up to speed, uh, getting corrected with my M dashes. I only learned about M dashes uh, maybe a month or so ago. Mm-hmm. And you've been editing all of my work since uh-huh. then and going, okay, I've got to fix every one of these right. times. Where he, yeah, yeah. yeah, I don't have to do a find and replace anymore. You can just do it for me. Good, good, yeah. good, good, good. <laughs> so we're good and up to speed. Listen, <laughs> thanks for joining us. We're going to talk about much more than M dashes in this, <laughs> in, in this conversation. Uh, excited to be joined by a special guest and to uh, a, a friend of G3. And uh, let me tee up uh, his uh, intro by explaining he is the pastor teacher of Grace Life Church of Ed. Edmonton, Canada, graduated with his MDiv and DMIN degrees from the Master's Seminary, and he and his wife Erin have two sons. In fact, his wife, dear friend of of, of our of, you know of the ministry here, G three of our podcast, just thinking, and so great to be joined by our dear friend, uh, Pastor James Coates. Man, welcome to Honest Conversations. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Excited to see you. Yeah. Would rather see you in person, of course, and Lord willing, that'll happen uh, later this year. But yeah. um, but good to be here, and glad to yeah. see you guys. Yeah, absolutely, man. We're we're excited. We were we were extremely excited in a number of different ways. One, to get a chance to uh, to meet you in person. My, my first time meeting you in person was at the G three conference in twenty twenty one at the national conference there. And uh, I mean, I I'd interacted. Your wife is such a social media butterfly, and so <laughs> got a chance to connect with her in, in that space. And of course, as you are undergoing all the issues and challenges with the church and things going on there in Canada, we would hear more of you through her. Uh, got familiar with your ministry through that kind of process. Uh, but man, it was great to finally meet you in person. Had prayed for you, had prayed for your ministry, had watched all the events unfold, and uh, so it was great to get a chance to connect with you, see you face to face, and and everything. I, I would say this about you, uh, everything you see is what you get. And I mean that in the best of ways, uh, uh, just a genuine heart, a, a person who's passionate about the gospel, passionate about Christ, passionate about the preaching of the word of God, uh, got that very sense of who you were when I got a chance to meet you. Uh, it was again, our, our joy and pleasure to, to host you uh, and to have you speak at the G3 conference and uh, looking forward actually to having you back again yeah. uh, this coming up uh, year for, for our 2023 conference. Um, with all of that said, by way of trying to t- completely embarrass you uh, mm-hmm. and uh, and uh, and share that with you, wanted to unpack how excited we were to partner with you in this other way as well. Uh, I'll let jo- I'll let uh, Scott tee it up a little bit for us uh, as it relates to the book and and G three Press and how th- those dots got connected. Yeah, I'll let J- I'll let uh, uh, Scott kind of tee up what what that looked like. Yeah, you mentioned uh, you mentioned Aaron a, mom- a moment ago. I don't I don't I I assume you know this, James. I think I put it in the email, but I first got wind of this material, which we've now published as Preaching and Hearing God's Word, mm-hmm. from Aaron's Instagram account. Oh, wow. She mentioned something about your demon project, mm-hmm. and hopefully one day this will get published. And of course, I'm always on the uh, the right. prowl for yep. good, good resources yep. uh, to publish with G3 Press. And so I think it's because of that, uh, that I, you know, that post that I saw on Instagram that I reached out to you and said, "Hey, we would be interested if if you're uh, if you're willing." And uh, we worked together. And this is a fantastic book. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is it is a it is an easy read, yes. an accessible read, yes. but really dealing with the the subject of both preaching and hearing God's word. Mm-hmm. Which I love John MacArthur, the little, little blurb we put on the on the cover from his endorsement, where he says, "A must read for all who preach." 
and all who listen, mm-hmm. which means if Everybody. you're a Christian and you're breathing, you should you should read this book. <laughs> Everybody, <right? laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So, okay, what what this this came out of your demon project? Is that right? Yeah. So, in the Doctor of Ministry program at the Master's Seminary, early on in the whole program, they have you thinking about this project that you'll do at the end of it, and you can do. A dissertation, but they encourage you to do a project, a preaching project, because it brings the whole congregation into uh, the experience. Because that project involves surveying the congregation, tracking their progress through the series and everything else. So as you're going through the program, you're looking for something that that you want to devote to a preaching project. And as I was doing some reading uh, in conjunction with that program. I, I saw a couple of resources that are that are modern day resources that were actually moving the dial of my heart, elevating even my own theology of preaching. Now, to begin with, I already had a pretty high view of preaching, but these guys were talking about preaching in a way that seemed to be just ever so subtly moving the dial even higher. And then we we got into a historical analysis of various preachers throughout the centuries, and it was Michael Reeves who did that. And he got to Calvin. And when he did Calvin, I I realized, okay, John Calvin is talking the same way these modern guys are talking. So part of the preaching project is a a historical figure that you work into that that project. And so I knew I wanted to study John Calvin and write a historical paper on him. And that ends up being one of the chapters, not in the book, but in the project itself. Anyway, it was through that whole process of kind of looking at John Calvin's preaching ministry that I began to think, okay, I want to do a project on preaching. And then naturally, if you're going to do a project on preaching, it'd be helpful if it had like an application that was connected with it because you're going to involve the congregation in it. And that just evolved then into marrying a theology of preaching with a theology of listening. That if preaching is this, as the book claims, then how then should we listen? And so you've got lots of resources that sort of deal with preaching and a theology of preaching. And there's a couple of good resources that are recent that deal with listening. And this is kind of marrying the two and taking a very historical reform view of preaching and putting that right alongside listening. So I think it's a really helpful resource. I I, I agree. And I appreciate you kind of breaking that out. This is about a theology of of preaching. We don't we don't think of it in that in that way. Mm -hmm. I I think more times than not, we think of uh, of of preaching as, hey, this is a message we're going to hear. Either someone was a good preacher or a bad preacher. It's more about methodology. than theology. Absolutely. Absolutely. Much more about methodology than it actually is about about establishing the the, the doctrine of preaching. And what 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 does it mean? How do how do we establish uh, how we listen? What is it? What is preaching? In light of kind of current culture uh, and what we're seeing today, which is which is such a a tepid approach to preaching, right? If if you can even call it that, mm-hmm. uh, it's more like I, you know we, we we joke around here about twenty five minute TED talks uh, are what people are actually listening to, rather than having if that if, if twenty five minutes, <laughs> <laughs> right, right, twenty to twenty five minutes of, of of a TED talk, and 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 that's really what people go to hear or. Or they go to be simply entertained by someone. Uh, it's it's not that they've thought through theologically speaking. What is this thing that I'm about to engage in, as it relates to the Lord's day, as it relates to worship, as I hear God's word preached? Uh, and I think that was incredibly helpful. I I read it not as a not as a preacher, uh, but I, I read it as as the layperson, mm. uh, really try, trying to kind of establish what what I know what I believe it to be. But what does the Bible say that preaching is? And so I thought I thought your book was incredibly helpful to lay out the case in, in a lot of different respects. I, I want to ask you this question, though, uh, as, as we kind of continue our conversation. How did what you studied, not particularly this book just yet, but how did what you studied as you as you began to study the men that you talked about, historically speaking, church history, whether it was Calvin or others, how did it affect your approach to preaching in the pulpit? You know, it's a good question because I don't know that it fundamentally altered my approach, except for potentially elevating just the seriousness of it, which again, I already had a pretty serious view of preaching, a a high view of preaching, a, a significant appreciation for the responsibility of preaching. So I don't know that it, that I can say at this point in time that it fundamentally altered my, my approach to preparation, but 
Um, but certainly it it just elevated the maybe fine tuned absolutely it. Yeah. and 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 elevated the significance of the preaching moment. You know where it really comes down to is this. Oftentimes you'll hear the notion that in the corporate gathering, it's the reading of scripture that is the most perfect moment in the gathering. That when the when the word of God is being read, that is the moment that everything is perfect because the idea is there that the preacher hasn't gotten in the way at that point in time. And when the preacher gets involved, that's where the, the message gets kind of diluted or 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 missed or inaccurately handled. And 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 coming from even Luther himself. The most perfect moment in the corporate gathering is the accurate preaching of the Word of God. And, and that's built on the, the premise that the preaching of the Word of God is the Word of God. And so there's nothing... So when, you, when the preacher gets up to preach, so long as he is accurately handling the Word of God, he is therefore preaching the Word of God. And, and, and if he's preaching the Word of God, then what he preaches what he preaches is the word of God. And so that's the, that's the principle that underlies all of this, that, that it's the preached word that is the, the most efficacious, most perfect, most, um, most God-exalting moment in the corporate gathering. And, and that, that certainly places a huge responsibility on the preacher to make sure he has accurately handled the word of God. But so long as he has... It's not the reading of the Word of God that is most perfect. It's the preaching that's of it. That's good. That's good. That, I mean, that's so important because it, that could be very easily abused, right? We probably all have seen examples of of preachers where it's like, I am the voice of God, right. and they abuse that because they're not actually being faithful to the Word in their preaching. They're preaching their own ideas, but in such a way that they're— they're trying to, to communicate to their congregation that their own ideas are the very voice of God. And so I think what you helpfully do, and maybe you can help to flesh this out a little bit, you know, what are, what are the guardrails for a preacher mm-hmm. to, A, recognize the, the seriousness and weight of this? I mean, if, mm-hmm. this is, if this preaching is the very voice of God, then that's a very weighty thing. And what are the guardrails to make sure that when we're preaching, we're not just preaching our own words, we're, we are actually— we are actually functioning as God's voice to the people. Yeah. Well, I think you start from the premise of the authority of Scripture, that the Word of God is authoritative, and, and then you, you recognize that there's a, a straight line that one can draw, can draw from the authority of Scripture to the authority of preaching, so long as, again, the Word of God is accurately handled. So at that point in time, the preacher has a responsibility, 2 Timothy 2.15, to show himself approved by being diligent to accurately handle the word of truth. And that implies the word of truth can be accurately handled. So the the preacher has a responsibility of identifying the authorial intent of a given passage of scripture. What does this passage mean? And and then he is to declare that meaning. Now he's going to do that in the context of a sermon. A sermon is going to have an introduction and a conclusion. There's going to be illustrations and applications but it's the meaning of the text that has to be captured in the context of that sermon. And if that meaning is accurately represented to God's people, then God's word has been preached, his voice has been heard, and, and, and the, the listener needs to heed that message as though it came directly from God himself. So the, 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 the guardrails on this whole thing is an accurate handling of the word of God, and that puts the listener in the position as well of, of having to listen carefully and, and to test what they hear to ensure that it lines up with scripture. Now, now, in that, the listener's not sovereign over the scripture. They're not the ultimate judge. That's a, an act of humility where the listener comes under the word of God and submits to the Word of God and seeks to discern whether or not what they're hearing from the pulpit lines up with what the text says. And and if that's all there, then the preaching of the Word of God is the Word of God. They have just heard God's Word, His voice, and therefore they need to reckon with the message they've heard. And that takes the preacher out of the way. The, The listener can't sort of minimize what they've heard and just say, well, that's just your interpretation or... Um, that's just coming from a a human vessel, not authoritative. If the word of God has been accurately represented, it is authoritative. It comes with the full authority of God. And so that just elevates the listener. Now the the listener is far more accountable because if they have just heard the word of God, they've got to reckon with that word and ensure that they are are applying it to their lives and then living out 
uh, living out their life on the basis of that truth. Yeah. I, I love what you said in, in your book on page 17. You said to accurately handle God's word literally is to cut it straight. You know, you, and you, you, uh, you're exegeting the, the letter of Paul to Timothy. So Timothy was responsible to faithfully represent what God had said in his written word. To misrepresent God would be tantamount to perjury, a high crime against heaven. Uh, I underlined that because I thought about how many men in our day don't consider uh, the, 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 the wrong handling or, or the mishandling of God's word to that to that great degree. I think I, I, I think those kinds of words are important to consider, to think about. Uh, and what, what would you say, you know, to to people who are who are in situations or in an environment where they're dealing with pastors who are not rightly dividing God's word? How, how would you counsel them? What would you say to those folks? Well, I would say that if if the word of God is consistently being misrepresented from the pulpit of the church a person's in, then so long as there's another available church where they can go to where a more faithful exposition of God's word is taking place, they should really seek that out. And I realize that even as I say that, there are going to be folks who just have nowhere to go. They just don't have anywhere else to go. And that's, that's, that's devastating because, you know, even in the book itself, I make a, a, an argument that I think is, is, is fairly airtight that the preaching of the word of God is the primary means of grace in the life of the believer. It is the primary means by which God builds the believer up, builds up his church. And, and that's built on the premise that the word of God is the primary means of grace. And, and nobody would argue with that. Certainly God's word is primary. And it's the preached word. It's the crown jewel of the word's ministry. Because you've got, in theory, a, a man who's called and equipped and gifted, who is, who is dug into a text of scripture all week long and has mined that that text for all it's worth and is then going to render it into application that's going to be really significant and helpful for the hearer. And so so the, the, the preached word is the primary means of grace in the life of the believer. And so when you don't have access to that in the context of your local church, you are severely hindered in your ability to grow and to be the, 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 the firmly planted tree that bears fruit that we see in Psalm 1. So, so anyway, I yeah, if, if God's word's not being represented accurately on a consistent basis, then then it's not the place to be. And if there's no other no other place to go, I wouldn't necessarily, depending on the severity of the misrepresentation, encourage the person to remove themselves from fellowship. But they would need to supplement um, through other sound preaching um, uh, online or whatever else to be able to ensure that they are nourishing themselves upon the word of God. But in saying that. It's really important for everyone to understand that that listening to a sermon online, though helpful, necessary, wonderful, and everything else, is not the same as being in the corporate gathering where a local church is a temple of the Spirit of God, 1 Corinthians 3.16, where the Spirit is most operative during the, the, the corporate gathering and the ministry of the Word of God. There's no substitute for that. And, and so you can't make that up online. You can't make that up with, you know, a sermon that you're listening to um, um, on audio. You, you need to be with the people of God in the corporate gathering when the Spirit is, is most operative in the preaching of His Word and be a part of that organic growth that takes place as you are a member of an organic body of believers that, that, that is alive and, and active. Yeah, that's, that, that's such an important point, especially in our kind of individualistic uh, society, even an individualistic evangelicalism, mm-hmm. where we think, you know, all I need is my Bible and my personal, my personal prayer time, my personal Bible study, right. which of course is very, very important. But I think you nailed it right on the head. We, we miss God's means of grace mm-hmm. in our lives when we are not with the body sitting under the preaching of God's Word by a pastor who actually knows who we are, who is not only rightly dividing the Word of Truth, but is, but is applying it to our, our context, our lives, uh, and, and using the authoritative, sufficient, inerrant Word of God to do what Paul says in 2 Timothy, and that is correct, rebuke, exhort, uh, and all of those those powerful means, like you like you described, the means of grace that God has prescribed uh, for our lives. It, 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 it's so important. Uh, and you, you mentioned the issue of application, right? So 
the, the, the preached word is God's word, it is God's voice, if in as much as it is uh, rightly reflecting what the authorial intent of the text is. So how do you bridge that gap then to application? The preacher wants to apply, the preacher ought to apply the word of God to the lives of the, pe- of the people. Uh, it's really not preaching without application, right? Otherwise, it's just it's just teaching. teaching. Mm-hmm. But how do you make sure that what that your application to a contemporary context and situations that the people in your congregation are facing, how do you make sure that those applications are also faithful to the original text that you're preaching, such that they are like like you I think rightly said authoritative for the lives of the people. Well, they've got to be birthed out of the study of God's word ex- itself. And you're, you're, if you're an expositor, then you are, you are expositing a text in the context of the particular book that you're in. And so there's a context that's built in, plus you're, 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 you're getting the meaning of that text as is. And so your, your application has to be born out of that. And, and so you're going to have also, too, varying degrees of application. Some application is just, is just the text applied in the sense of exhortation the text says put sin to death therefore you need to put sin to death and so so there's your your obvious application in an exhortation now you can go a step removed from that and give some ways that you can put sin to death that aren't necessarily as authoritative as the word of god but are 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 inseparable from connected to the implications of the scripture and then the the listener's going to have to you know, wade through those applications and, and identify, you know, which ones necessarily need to be applied to their own lives. And so there's even degrees within the context of application where as the preacher, you've got to be wise in in discerning what application to make and then how to make it. Because you can have certain preaching situations where the pastor makes an application that that he claims is as authoritative as scripture, when in reality it's not. The the hearer has some room to to assess that application for their life and how it's gonna how it's gonna be reflected. And so the, the preacher has to be very careful. And this is really important, even as we think about this from a preaching perspective. A pastor is a steward of consciences, and and he he's a steward of the authority of God. And so he can only bind the conscience and use God's authority in a lawful way. And so, in my case, as a preacher, my job is to never, ever, ever um, misuse my authority as a preacher by binding a person's conscience where God doesn't. I have a responsibility of informing the conscience from the Word of God and ensuring the, the listener, the congregant, understands what God requires of them and I'm to protect them from anything that would bind their conscience on something that's unbiblical or, or is, is a, a matter of Christian liberty, for example. And so we've got to be wise as, as, as preachers to ensure that our application is flowing from the authorial intent of the scripture, that it fits the context that the, the, the text is even in within the particular church, for example, that the epistle is written to. And, and then I've got to be careful that I'm, I'm making distinctions between the, the necessary application of the text that comes with the full weight of God's authority and then other applications that are more illustrative of the text and, and where the listener has some liberty in terms of what that application is going to look like in their lives. And that just comes down to a preacher wanting to be faithful both to the text as well as to the role that they have in, in ensuring that they are a good and faithful steward of the authority God's given to them, which is really only an authority that comes from the Word of God. And so ensuring the Word of God is properly applied in the life Derivative of the church. Derivative authority, yeah. Yeah. James, I, I want to... I want I want to something you're you're as you're as you're unpacking all of this. One of the things that that keeps hitting me is the the level of depth and and thoughtfulness and seriousness with which you've considered uh, the subject matter that you're talking about the, that 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 the, the the means of grace that we experience through the preached word of God is, is something that every believer should should long for, should desire, should 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 view as important to their lives to such a degree that they pursue it, even if that pursuit means traveling for you know, 45 minutes to an hour to get somewhere where, that, where, the, where the Word of God is being preached. It's that important, right? It, it, it's critical in the life of the believer. I think, unfortunately, in our current day and culture, we have, we, we have so minimized uh, uh, 
what how how we view preaching. Uh, and, and it's become almost a form of entertainment to where if, if you know we go to hear one guy and if he didn't really tickle our fancy, we go hear another one. And maybe next week we'll go hear the guy. So you got these folks who are church hopping to kind of get the guy that kind of tickles their fancy to the best of their ability. And then when you have situations uh, like what you all underwent, uh, you know, a couple years ago with COVID, it's easy for people to fall back into uh, I'll just I'll just watch online. Yeah. Uh, I'll just I'll just I don't I don't necessarily need to go and experience the preached word of God with the with the you know with the body of, of, of believers there in a corporate setting. I can I can just watch something on online and, and, and you still have churches, unfortunately, who are suffering as a result. At the same time, I think if you if you witness, I know we're experiencing this here uh, at Praise Mill, those who 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 have a who have a theology of preaching, who have a seriousness about about this means of grace that we experience as a as 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 corporate believers. Those who take that seriously are flocking to spaces and places where others take that seriously. Uh, Maybe you could speak to that that dynamic. And even one of the things I would love for you to speak to. and, And my thought is you you take what you. Uh, you, what you've learned and even what you've placed in this book, there's a natural tendency to take for granted. Uh, and I don't, I don't mean that in a, in a negative way on, on, in your sense, but I just want you maybe to step outside of, of, of your norm uh, and maybe look at and, and reflect on how uh, this book uh, being kind of instilled in you as you were, as you were going through seminary uh, had an impact on, on the stands that you all took to meet corporately in the space where you were, how important it was for you to meet corporately and hear the preached word of God to the to the point where you'd make a stand like you did, uh, you know, two two years ago. I hope, I hope I'm I hope I'm making sense of of all what I shared with you. Yeah, I know you're right. So the preaching project, and I I might get the actual dates just a little bit wrong, but I think the preaching project wrapped up in the fall of 2019. Mm-hmm. Um. If I'm not mistaken, that's when it wrapped up. And and then our stand really took place in the fall of 2020. Mm-hmm. So, um, so there's no question that our congregation would say that the preaching project was providentially instrumental in laying some of the foundation that, that resulted in the stand that we took because we... I mean, our people already had a high view of preaching. So even for them, sure. the, the preaching project was just kind of maybe fine tuning, maybe moving the dial just a little bit. But but we had a, a, a an elevated appreciation for the corporate gathering as a result of that, where the the preaching as the primary means of grace can't be disconnected from that corporate gathering of the church on on the Lord's Day, where there's where there's also prayer as a means of grace and, and even singing and admonishing one another in that, in that venue as a means of grace. And, and even the fellowship that takes place in the context of the preached word, like think about it, when you come together as the body of Christ and you come together in worship and you sit under the preaching of God's word and that final amen in the service is said, now all of that that spiritual life that's just been unleashed on the body of Christ as the the word of God goes forth and the spirit energizes that in the life of the body gets unleashed on itself through fellowship. And, and, And that's critical because then the body comes together having been filled with the spirit to minister to one another in, 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 in a variety of capacities. And, and that also works to the building up of the body of Christ. So if you're just online and you're just getting the sermon, not only are you away from the, the the temple as it were first corinthians three sixteen, where the body is a temple and the spirit dwells in our midst but you are cut off from the fellowship that is the byproduct of having heard the word and been filled with the spirit and so there's no question that the corporate gathering is critical the preaching project was instrumental in laying the foundation that we would then stand upon when it came time to go toe-to-toe with the governing authorities and it was really in god's providence that all of that came together i mean he he had a plan because, you know, I'm not smart enough to, to kind of set all that up. I mean, I, I didn't know it was coming. And, and so he was providentially working in my life to make, to, to bring me to the project that I preached and, and to have it be the, um, the help that it was to our church for that season that we went through. Yeah. I, I can, I can see that being the case as I, as I, as I read through this, my thinking is this, and, and I, I don't disagree with, 
with uh, with what uh, uh, Pastor John MacArthur said about this. I, I think th- this is a this is a, a digestible book. It's it, you know mm-hmm. I, I don't know how many how many pages we got here, but mm-hmm. you know eighty some odd pages. This. This this little booklet I think should be in the hands of every single church, uh, yep. every single pastor, uh, passing it out to every single individual mm-hmm. for the strengthening of their local church. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the things that we we try to do here at G three we want to we want to put resources in the hands of local churches uh, that, that that educate, encourage, and, and equip them uh, for for sound doctrine and and for and for God's glory. Uh, and and as I listen to you unpack this, I it's because I experience all the things you're speaking about and my local congregation, that what you're saying is exciting to me. My thought would be, if you have a low view of church, if you have a low view of, of the gathered uh, uh, body, uh, if, if you have a low view of, of the means of grace, probably what you're hearing from from, from you, uh, uh, James, from us as well, it, that's kind of boring. Yeah. It's kind yeah. of bo- what you guys are talking about is boring. It's right. like, no, because as, as you're talking about it, I, I'm reflecting upon what I just experienced this past Lord's Day. Right, right. You know, with the people that I gathered with. Yeah, I think, I think James, how, you, how you've how you put it a couple times now is the critical point, and that is the church is the temple of the living God. Mm-hmm. And it is true that we as individual Christians are the temple of the Holy Spirit. There are passages that emphasize that mm-hmm. reality. Mm-hmm. But I think what you've drilled down on, James, is the fact that the gathered church is the temple of God in a unique and distinct way mm-hmm. that is not true when I'm just as an, an individual Christian by myself. Yeah. Yeah. And I cannot forsake that. The Holy Spirit is at work and present differently and in a unique sense through the body, through the one another ministry before and after, yeah. uh, and in the preached moment of the service, and as you mentioned, James, in, in all of these uh, means of grace that are part of the corporate worship, the reading of the Word, the preaching of the Word, the praying praying of the Word, singing of the Word, all of these things in the context of the gathered church are something unique and special that God has designed. And again, we've lost that in our individualistic sort of uh, evangelicalism today. Yeah, yeah. So what we end up doing is we, we end up showing up to church. If we have a low view, we show up to church, figure out whether or not it was entertaining enough, make mm-hmm. sure that my kids got, you know, got got their little coloring, you know, little Bible verse or whatever. Uh, and, and, and then we go home, we check the box. We were good Christians rather mm-hmm. than the kinds of things that you're talking about that, that really amplify, strengthen the church uh, and cause it to be for the glory that God intended it to be uh, as a light to the rest of the world. And so, uh, again, I, as you're again, as you're talking about that, I'm reflecting upon that. I'm th- I'm thinking that, that again, this book is a is, is a must read for, for for pastors, for church leaders to. Uh, you know, I, I would buy this thing in bulk. Yeah, it'd be uh, good for a pastor to hand out to new members. Absolutely, and, yeah, absolutely, yeah. pass out in, in in bulk and just pass out to to to, to those who are a part of the congregation. It's an easy read. It's easy to understand. It's easy to capture. I love the other piece of what you did was it was the charge to the pastor uh, as he's preparing to preach his preparation, uh, you know, be, being able to effectively preach the word of God, but also to the listener as well. And I know I know you touched on that early on. It, 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 it requires uh, coming with the intent of listening to hear something that changes your life because it is indeed the very living, breathing word of God. Yeah, you, you've touched on that, James, a couple times, you know, the, the, the responsibility of the listener in light of that. Can, can you flesh that out a little more, like, based on all of this, based on the foundation that you lay concerning preaching being the very word and very voice of God, how should that affect the people in the pews? How should that affect people sitting under the preaching of God's word? Well, it should, it should really impact behavior before, during, and after. So there should be preparation leading up to, because in essence, you're going to meet with God and be subjected to his voice. In fact, we even get into in that book, the the preaching of the word of God, mediating God's presence. And so there's a mediation of God's presence that takes place with the preached word. And you see that in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 14, 24 and 25, where there, where the prophetic word renders the sinner as open and laid bare before God, that's yes. Hebrews 4, but yes. they declare God is certainly in your midst because they've heard the prophetic word and they've been indicted under that word and, and, and convicted of their sin. So, so preaching even mediates God's presence. So we have a, a weekly scheduled appointment with God and, and we should be preparing for that both by praying for the preacher and his time in the study, but also tilling the soil of our own heart personally in, in prayer and, and the word and, and going into that preaching moment with anticipation that we're going to hear from God. And then even in the moment itself, 
you know, the listener can have various approaches to how they want to go about that. I'm not a note taker myself. Uh, I like to let the, the, the sermon leave an impression upon my heart as I listen. But as I listen, if there are particular points of conviction or, or insight, I may want to make note of that. And so it might be helpful to just track the outline so you're able to identify a moment of conviction and, and enough around that to be able to then go back to it later on that day and, and, and address it in prayer before God and try and get back into that very moment that you were in, in the service itself. Like sometimes we hear uh, a sermon and we're convicted about something and boom, we confess it, turn from it and move forward. Other stuff requires some soul searching and we want to be able to go back to it because the sermon moment, the, the service doesn't always facilitate that kind of hard analysis because, you know, the sermon's moving along. So, so to take enough notes to be able to get back into your headspace and then do some application of that after the service, I mean, you've got activity before, during, and after that needs to take place in order to, to really get all of the sanctifying power out of that preaching moment. Yeah. So I love I love the part I love what you just mentioned and in the book about the the presence of God being in the preached word. There's so much talk today about experiencing God's presence, and usually it's connected to some sort of emotional atmosphere created by music. When in reality, like you point out, we we want the presence of God, but no word, no preached word, no presence. The presence of God is experienced through His Word. That's what the Holy Spirit has promised to use, and that's how we experience the presence of God. That, that's that's a, a powerful point. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think also, you know, as as I hear you unpack this, as I've had a chance to read through through the material here, uh, it would it, it helps even a, even a, a church culture uh, that is a bit anemic. Uh, on understanding what you just said, mm-hmm. which is that the pre- in, in God's presence is in His preached word. Uh, if you're searching for seeking some kind of uh, experiential, mystical kind of experience uh, based upon a lot of singing and and, and melody, uh, you, you're missing what God intends in in the in, in, in the common grace of, of of the preached word of God. Uh, I, I just I, I love what you said there. I think it's important for us to think about to consider. I think it's critically important for pastors. Uh, who, who, who want to shepherd their church as well uh, to, to consider. Um, I, I, I want to kind of just lastly just kind of ask you, as you're looking at the landscape of, of, of culture, of, of church culture in particular, you're thinking about preaching and, uh, and, and the like, what do, you, what do you feel like is maybe, maybe the most, most challenging thing uh, that, that really impacts preaching either negatively or, 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 maybe, or maybe something that's positive uh, that you're seeing take place over the, you know, over, over the course of the, the, you know, the last few years uh, as it relates to preaching? You know, I think the biggest the biggest piece is there's a there's a responsibility on the part of the preacher, and all of us are limited in terms of our ability and giftedness and everything else. But there's a responsibility on the preacher to invest into the preached word, to take pains with these things. First Timothy four, in such a way that that the listener can see that the preacher has really done his work and has labored in the text of Scripture, and that when he brings what he brings on Sunday, it's, it's not with flippancy. It's with, it's with intentionality, intensity, with a, with a, a sobriety, so that the, the listener comes. I've had one congregant recently say, we know that you put a lot of time and effort into your sermons. You make it worthwhile to come. And so as preachers, I think we've got to you know, going back to the comment that was just made, Scott, as far as seeking the presence of God. I mean, my most intense moments of joy and excitement and a sense of the glory of God and His presence come from preaching. So folks who are seeking some other sort of existential experience of God's presence through some other avenue just have never experienced the real thing. There's no way to do better than this. Remember when Jesus was walking with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus? The, their, their hearts burned within them as he spoke the truth to them. I experienced that under the preaching of the word of God. And, and so we have a responsibility as preachers to bring the word of God to bear upon the lives of God's people that the truth might burn in their hearts. And of course, it's the Spirit's work to do that. But, but we need to bring all of the you know, the tools of the trade to the table, everything necessary to make that fire burn and let the spirit work in the hearts of God's people. So I think, 
I think preaching's got to get better. I think preaching's got to improve. I think if if preaching improved and was more intensely biblical and 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 checked off all the boxes that it should check off, uh, that's going to have an impact on the body of Christ. And I think if if we had other men who were here, like Dr. Steve Lawson, for example, they would say that that no revival in in church history has ever taken place apart from the preached word. And so if there's going to be a, a reformative time in the life of the church, it's going to be through preaching. And so we just need to see a, a restoration of biblical preaching along with prayer and everything else that needs to come alongside that and fuel that. And I think that will have a massive impact on building up the body of Christ and, and persuading congregations that preaching is truly critical to their spiritual growth and development. Well, James, after after this, brother, I'm ready to go preach somewhere. Like I got, <laughs> I got to figure out when, when when my next assignment is so I can get my preach on. But brother, listen, I yeah. so thoroughly enjoyed our conversation, and and want to encourage everyone uh, to go grab this book. Uh, you definitely want to grab this book, Preaching uh, and Hearing God's Word uh, by James Coates. We're excited to have you. I'm, I'm going to ask Scott any any last last comments that you want to share before yeah, we no, wrap. No, I, I I echo that. Encourage uh, all all pastors who are listening or watching to pick this up. Uh, you know, like like you said, James, you might already have a high view of preaching, but this is just going to fuel that. Mm-hmm. It's going to be an encouragement. Uh, it's going to enrich maybe a, a particular aspect of your preaching task mm-hmm. that uh, maybe you hadn't considered before. Uh, and again, if you're listening or watching and you're just a church member, pick this up because yeah. it will better help you understand the task that is set before your pastor. Uh, you will know better how to pray for your pastor, and you will know better how to prepare and come to a, a service on the Lord's mm-hmm. Day to sit under the preached Word of God and to take in what God has for you. So this is a, a very helpful, useful, applicable book, uh, I think, no matter who you are. Tell me, th- tell me this. What are, you preaching? what are you preaching on at your church currently? Where are you guys at currently? You know, I'm just wrapping up a series on the kingdom of God. So I, I've got, uh, it'll be eight parts, an eight-part series on the kingdom of God. It, it began with the, the meta-narrative of Scripture and then got into the covenants and then the prophets, then the day of the Lord, and then into uh, the Olivet Discourse, kingdom parables. I was in Revelation 20 this past Sunday. And then next week's going to be all application. So in light of our study of the kingdom of God, what does um, what can we legitimately claim as present kind of glimmers or manifestations of the kingdom and uh and and so getting into the church the home the workplace politics culture and uh so it's been an an amazing series and i would certainly commend people to it and uh it's been uh it's been good for our church for sure good good well, James, thanks for joining us, man, for this episode of Honest Conversations. It's a joy to have you, man. Looking forward to connecting with you uh, when we can in the spaces and places that you'll be in. Uh, again, we want to encourage everyone, if they get the opportunity, uh, to check out Grace Life Church. You can go online at uh, gracelife.ca uh, and uh, learn more about their church and about what's going on there. And definitely, by all means, pick up the book, Preaching and Hearing God's Word. Thanks again for joining us on this edition of Honest Conversations in Black and White.